Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Angela Grimes, CEO of Born Free USA, and we have a really wonderful panelist lineup for you to talk about international perspectives on trapping. We have Dr. Liz Tyson from Born Free USA, who will talk about trapping in the United States and our recent report, Crushing Cruelty. Leslie Fox, Executive Director of the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals, who will discuss efforts to end trapping in Canada. And Newton Simiu, Research Officer at Born Free Kenya, who will speak on their work to combat illegal snaring and the associated bushmeat trade in Kenya. Follow the, following the presentations today, we're gonna to take some time to answer your questions. So please use the Q&A function or the chat to submit any questions you might have for any of our panelists and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of our time. Um, for those of you who may be new to Born Free USA, we were founded on the fundamental belief that wild animals belong in the wild. And it's no coincidence that our name shares that of the iconic film from the 1960s, which starred our founders, Virginia McKenna and Bill Travers. Uh, that film told the real life story of Elsa, an orphaned lioness who is rehabilitated and returned to the wild. And our vision is a coexistent future where humans no longer exploit wild animals. Uh, we are a global organization that includes offices here in the United States, the United Kingdom, as well as Kenya, South Africa, and Ethiopia. And collectively, the Born Free family has programs supporting wildlife, communities, and nature on five continents. We are working to end a number of threats that affect not only entire species survival, but also individual lives. Some of these include wildlife traffic, trafficking, the exotic pet trade, and animals who are kept in captivity in industries such as zoos and traveling shows. And we also rescue and care for animals who have been caught up in many of those exploitive fields at our sanctuaries around the world, um, including our primate sanctuary in Texas, which is home to more than 400 monkeys, many of whom were rescued from research labs, private homes, and zoos. And of course, we work on today's topic, trapping. Uh, and up first, I'd like to bring, welcome Dr. Liz Tyson to the screen, Born Free USA's Programs Director. Liz has helped animals around the globe. She helped establish the very first locally run sterilization program for street dogs in the Middle East. She worked with indigenous communities in the Colombian Amazon to end the hunting of wild primates, ran a UK charity campaigning to end the exploitation of animals in circuses and zoos, and helped design a new rehabilitation complex for rescued monkeys at Born Free Sanctuary in Ethiopia. In 2018, she earned her doctorate in animal welfare law. Welcome, Liz, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this webinar um, and our other panelists. I just want to give you a bit of a heads up. We have, I'm located in South Texas at the Primate Sanctuary. We've had storms the last few days which have cut our power. I'm hoping I'm not going to disappear on you all. If I do, we have a plan B and Angela will take over from me, but hopefully it will go well. Also, forewarning, my dogs sometimes bark at the thunder, so we may have participation from them, but that's part of the course in these COVID times. I'm going to dive straight in because we have a lot to get through. So. In 108 countries around the world, the use of leg hold traps has been banned or heavily restricted. The US is not one of those countries. In the US, leg hold and other traps can be used by private citizens in 48 of 50 states. In addition, taxpayers' money continues to fund trapping by government officials and agencies in the name of wildlife management or pest control. Believe it or not, trapping is even permitted within the National Wildlife Refuge System, places where animals should be safe from harm. In addition to leg hold traps, conny bear or body gripping traps, drowning traps and snares are widely used as a means of catching and killing animals for their fur, for fun, or because they're deemed a nuisance. Overall, it's estimated that over 3 million animals are trapped each year in the US for their fur. The number of animals killed for other purposes is unknown and undocumented. Now to accompany the new report that Angela mentioned that we released last month on this issue, we also carried out extensive research into the regulatory landscape of trapping across the US, scoring each state on the legal framework in place to protect animals from this cruel practice out of 100. Disappointingly, not a single state scored full marks. 
With the exception of California and Hawaii, all states allow trapping by private citizens for recreational and commercial purposes. All of those states have some form of licensing regime in place. However, not all trapping activity requires a license. At the bottom of the trapping league table, we find Maine and where I'm speaking to you from today, Texas, which both scored an appalling six out of 100. Indeed, Maine is the only state that still allows bear trapping. Now, while the lowest scores barely registered on a 100 point scale, the majority of other states really didn't do much better. Indeed, almost half of the states scored 25 out of 100 or less, with only six states having banned leg hold traps, five states having banned body gripping traps and 12 states having prohibited snares. Of the 48 states that do allow recreational and commercial trapping, only 26 demand that would-be trappers complete an education course prior to the grant of a license. Now, one might think that if trapping is to be allowed, at the very least, educational courses can't be a bad thing. However, it appears that along with instructional information on how to best kill animals using traps, the trapper education courses are also part of a cynical public relations exercise to uphold the archaic pastime. The very first paragraph of the New York State Trapper Education Manual reads as follows. Trapping is enjoyable and it provides a variety of benefits for those with the knowledge and ability to do it well. But if trapping is not done right, it can cause bad feelings towards trappers and trapping. Therefore, trapping is a serious business. Worryingly, it appears that a fundamental reason for the courses is to protect the image and future of trapping against those who would dare to criticize it. Trapping, we're told, is not a serious business because it takes the lives of millions of innocent animals each year, but because if not done right, it can cause bad feelings towards trappers and damage public perceptions. The manual continues to paint a sanitized and romanticized history of trapping in the US, skipping directly from mention of the beaver fur trade, helping to support the establishment of European settlers, to this statement. Thanks to sound wildlife management, large populations of fur bearers still exist. The manual thereby suggests this kind of centuries long unbroken chain of responsible management of an ever abundant population of fur bearing animals. In fact, the US fur trade devastated beaver populations all but driving the species to extinction. It's certainly not thanks to trapping that these animals are plentiful today. Now, some manuals, including the one published by Wisconsin and based on a template produced by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the AFWA, also go to some lengths to promote ideological viewpoints that pit the trapping community against those who oppose the practice, arguing that only a small number of quote animal rights activists are opposed to trapping on ideological grounds, rather than on the basis that trapping is simply cruel. The manual suggests that trappers are both concerned with and promote animal welfare as follows. Most Americans, including those who trap, care about animal welfare. A small number of people hold animal rights beliefs. A person concerned with animal welfare wants to minimize pain and suffering when animals are trapped or used in any other way. A person who believes in animal rights believes animals have a right not to be trapped at all. Now, in fact, while animal rights advocates, and I include myself amongst those, certainly oppose trapping, one doesn't have to align with a strict animal rights position in order to oppose the cruelty and suffering that traps inflict on their innocent victims. So to suggest that only a small number of people are opposed to trapping on a purely ideological basis, particularly when we already know over a hundred nation states around the world have banned or restricted this practice, and that trapping can somehow coexist with good animal welfare is disingenuous to say the least. In the same vein of cynically distorting the reality of trapping, of great concern is this statement, again in the New York Trapper Education Manual. When trapping in water for semi-aquatic species, all traps should be placed in a manner that will submerge, which is used as a euphemism for drown, the captured animal. This causes a quick and humane death. Now, there is no truth whatsoever to the statement that drowning an animal to death is humane or quick. And that's just not that's not just a matter of our opinion. But the American Veterinary Medical Association has categorically confirmed that drowning is not a means of euthanasia and is inhumane. Even the descriptions of the traps themselves used in the courses give potential trappers incomplete and misleading information. Euphemistically, again, referring to snares as cable devices, the AFWA manual describes them as live restraining traps that are designed to capture an animal alive and unharmed. In reality, animals caught in snares are regularly caught by the neck and strangled to death. The damage done by snares Newton will be talking about soon. 
Even those who do not die in the snare often suffer serious injury to limbs as they struggle against the wire, which is specifically designed to tighten the more they fight against it. The same section of the manual describes foothold traps in the same manner, but the injury caused by foothold traps, including animals losing paws or limbs or even being killed is well documented. To suggest that either of these devices capture animals unharmed is demonstrably false and it defies logic. These are just a few examples of the way in which government written education courses actively distort the truth about trapping. Now, whatever we think of trapping, the fact that all states which allow private citizens to trap have some form of licensing regime should theoretically mean that at least the practice is being somewhat monitored. Not so, as many traps are available for completely unrestricted purchase from online sales platforms, including e-commerce giants, Amazon and eBay. This means that anyone who is either trying to actively circumvent the law or was simply ignorant of the need for a license could simply go online, make their purchase in seconds, that killing devices will be delivered to their door within days, absolutely no questions asked. And while the trapping industry work hard to ensure that narratives surrounding trapping are sanitized to perpetuate claims of humane practice and animal welfare concern, harrowing reviews from verified purchases on Amazon not only provide photographic evidence, but clearly demonstrate the reality of trapping and the suffering of their victims. Now, the following slides, they're not graphic, um, but these will give you an example of some of the less graphic reviews that we found. Be prepared for what you're going to do with a wild animal caught in the snare, fighting for his life and suffering and crying. The snare tightened around the raccoon. When I came to see what animal was crying, the raccoon jumped and the snare tightened even more, causing the raccoon to cry out even louder. I thought these traps would kill ground squirrels immediately. First one was pinched in the middle, but still alive. May have been that way for hours. Easy to set, difficult to remove. I was trying to snare a coyote and ended up with the neighbor's dog. We have a very difficult time removing, removing it, ended up cutting it. Does the job perfectly on wild animals though. While it's perfectly possible for those without a license to purchase traps on Amazon, it's not necessarily the case that traps purchased on Amazon and other sites are being used illegally in most cases, despite the site making absolutely no attempt to verify this at point of purchase. That said, the site also allows the sale of leg hole traps for bears, while using leg hole traps to capture bears is illegal in every single US state. After this webinar, we'll be sending an email to all attendees to join us in calling on Amazon to ban the sale of traps on their site, and we really hope you'll join us. So in summary, the cruelty of traps can't be overstated. They cause stress, injury, and death to millions of animals every single year. While all states have some form of regulation for trapping, there is absolutely no way to make this practice humane or kind. And while it persists, so too will the suffering of animals. If more than 100 countries around the world have succeeded in prohibiting or at least severely restricting trapping, there is absolutely no excuse for the US to allow it to continue. Now that's all from me. The storm allowed me to, to stay on with you, which I'm delighted about. I'm really happy now to be able to hand you over and introduce Leslie Fox. Leslie Fox is the Executive Director for the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals, known as the Fur Bearers for short, and is passionate about wildlife. She also serves on the Board of Directors for the Society for Humane Science and is President and Board Chair for the Albany Community and Women's Service Society. Leslie is a Certified Humane Education Specialist through the National Association for Humane and Environmental Education and graduated with honours, my goodness, you've got so many qualifications, graduated with honours from the British Columbia Institute of Technology in public relations, marketing communications, and not-for-profit management. She's currently doing even more. She's currently finishing her Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary study, Studies at Royal Rose University. She lives with her partner, Kat, and two guinea pigs on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, and is going to be talking to us today about her brilliant work with her organisation in Canada. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much, Liz, and welcome everyone. Um, it's wonderful. I'm watching the chat and seeing where everyone is from, and I just um, think that's fantastic. So, despite these difficult times, um, and and it is always you know difficult over camera and Zoom, uh, it's a great way to connect with people in ways that we never have before. So, I'm absolutely. Uh, delighted that you're all able to join us and I'm just going to take a second now to set myself up here and um, share my screen. 
And so I hope um, you can all see that and hear me okay. <laughs> um, so again, welcome everyone. My name is Leslie Fox and I work for a group. It's called the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals. Um, and that's quite a mouthful. So we just shorten it to say the fur bearers. So just give you a quick overview of um, who we are and some of our work and talk to you a little bit about the state of trapping in Canada. So the fur bears, we've been around for quite a while. Uh, this is a throwback photo. I think it was probably 60s or 70s. Uh, the organization was established in 1953. So we're one of the oldest animal welfare groups in Canada. And specifically our mandate focuses on the fur bearers. Um, a fur bear is defined under the legislation as an animal whose pelt has commercial value. So an animal that is traded internationally for their fur. Of course, the fur is made um, into products, you know, fashion, fast fashion, collars, cuffs, keychains, um, those types of types of products. Uh, so again, this organization's been been fighting that for a very long time and um, trapping has been a big campaign for us. So today I'm going to just be giving you a little bit of an overview, uh, of course, talking to you a little bit about trapping in Canada and why animals are trapped for their fur, the legal landscape in Canada. So there's a lot of similarities, obviously, to the United States, but there's some um, interesting aspects here that you might not be aware of. And then um, wrapping up the presentation today with the future of fur uh, from a Canadian perspective, how are things going, where are things at, and what you can do to help. So trapping in Canada, so similar with the United States and the rest of the world, uh, fur bearing animals are targeted uh, for their fur specifically, so their pelt, and then also because they're perceived to be a nuisance. That's something we're seeing more and more of actually is trapping, trappers who are getting out of the fur business because there's really not a lot of money left in it anymore. And that they're using their skills, however, to target um, animals like wolves or coyotes, more of the predators, predator control, those types of programs. And that's how they're um, able to stay relevant. Fur bears, again, in, in Canada, animals that are, are trapped include uh, coyotes, uh, bobcats, lynx, wolves, foxes, mink, river otter, beaver, wolverine, fisher, pine marten, rabbits, and I think I've covered all the major ones. Um, and again, for these animals, these species are not trapped for food. Uh, there's no market, of course, for the meat for many of those animals. Trapping methods are uh, very similar to other countries. The leg hold trap is still legal in Canada. Only the models with teeth have been prohibited, but certainly there's many other models out there. Uh, conibear traps, snares, and duke cuff traps, egg traps, we'll talk a little bit about those. And live traps are really worth a mention and I'll explain why shortly. The majority of hap uh, trapping happens in the provinces of Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. So uh, the United States, you have states. In Canada, we have provinces. And then, of course, territories in, in the north is how the, the country's geography is set up. So again, uh, Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia uh, have sort of the highest numbers. There's a real myth in, in Canada that trapping happens up north in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of fallacies that get brought up. There's, there's a bit of a nostalgia associated with trapping that Canada was founded on the fur trade, um, that it's part of our history, it's part of our identity. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a narrative that's often perpetuated, uh, romanticism of sorts of, you know, there's an image of old man Bob working the trap line, um, these, these types of scenarios, and they're simply not true. The majority of trapping actually happens close to our urban centers. So just a quick legal landscape. Statistics are so difficult. Um, the, and the reason why is it's just not reported anymore. And so you often see different groups or individuals publish numbers and um, it, they're really inaccurate. So the last available statistic is actually from 2009 and that was published by Statistics Canada, our government agency. And at that point in time, it was about 700,000 animals that were being trapped for their fur. That number obviously doesn't include animals that are targeted because they're perceived to be a pest or nuisance and it doesn't include the non-target animals um, of course uh, you know animals like 
uh, pets of people's dogs, cats, birds, and we know um, that there's quite a few animals that aren't tar or non targets um, that unfortunately are killed or maimed in traps every years, every year. Um, overall, you know, again, trapping is regulated at the provincial level, so it really varies from province to province, but there are some commonalities. The big one is, is that all of the legislation is so difficult to enforce. Enforcement is a real problem here. Uh, there's also arbitrary um, laws, for example, trap check times. Um, so trappers in many provinces are required to check their traps, you know, within 24 hours or 72 hours. How that is even enforced, I have absolutely no idea. So clearly there's no one with a stopwatch at the other end, um, you know, tracking how long these animals have been in these, these devices for. We, we also have um, big problems with just staffing. So organizations that are tasked with enforcement, for example, our natural resource officers, um, they're overburdened with, with, you know, other priorities. Uh, there's a lack of funding, there's a lack of staff, and it, it, it really means that trapping and, and enforcement just falls off their radar. Traps can be set close to home, so um, we use meters uh, here in Canada, so it's uh, between, you know, 200 to 300 meters, so that's just, you know, 0 0.12 miles, so very close to, again, you can set a trap legally uh, near a home or a school. Warning signs are not required typically, and also ID tags are not required. And that really matters because when there's a problem or an issue, it's virtually impossible to have any traceability. So there's no way, um, so for example, if a dog was caught in a trap, there's no way to look at that trap and, and quickly understand like who it could potentially belong to. There's no mechanism for traceability. And um, we've seen that time and time again, where inevitably something goes wrong, and there's no recourse. Um, and even when our organization offers rewards uh, for information leading to the, to the identification or conviction of those responsible, um, it just doesn't happen. And it's, it's a very, very frustrating uh, problem. And so it's something that we've been lobbying quite aggressively uh, here in Canada, just to try to have some of these basic protections while we move ideally towards an end uh, to trapping period. Types of traps, similar to the US, uh, leg holds. So again, only the models with teeth have been prohibited, but there's many other versions and styles of leg hold traps, specifically uh, marketed as a soft catch trap. So the, that's a trap with a, a, a bit of a pad in it. Um, actually, I just remembered I have a, a trap handy right here. <laughs> I'll show you in a second. Um, also um, laminated trap, offset trap for leg hold. Conibear traps, and I have one right here actually next to my desk. <laughs> um, so this is called a conibear trap. Uh, this is size is, is a 330. It's a very clunky device. Um, this would be used for an animal like a beaver. Um, and this this part here comes comes out. So it looks sort of like this when it's when it's set. The animal comes through, um, and then these bars come come down, breaking the the back of their neck. It's an awful device. Look how clunky and awkward it is they're they're extremely aggressive and again the intention of the conibear trap is to break an animal's uh, neck or spine we often see dogs um uh unfortunately caught and killed in these types of devices snares that's a wire noose um the photo here on the right that um, was actually a photo from a case we worked on a few weeks ago where an individual was trapping rabbits because they didn't want rabbits in their garden and they were using what looks almost like a some kind of a coat hanger um, so snares can be homemade even um, and all these things are permitted under the legislation and um, just want to introduce you now to a couple traps that you might not hear a lot about it's called the duke cuff trap or an egg trap so this here is the Duke cuff, this here is an egg. These traps were the industry's answer to trying to prevent um, dogs getting caught and killed in traps. So they're often used to target raccoons. And the reason why is raccoons tend, they have curious um, little minds and little hands and they like to put their hand into things to grab bait or food rewards. Um, so similar to a leg hold trap, when the raccoon sticks their their hand into these um, devices, there's a mechanism, um, a spring-loaded 
bar on the inside that comes smashing across and you can kind of see here down at the bottom of these traps um, what, what happens. And then close up here, that's a Duke cuff trap. I can't even explain to you the suffering that these devices cause. They're Unfortunately, they're widely available. You don't need a license um, in Canada to purchase one. You don't need a license to set one if it's on your own private property. And the, the cases, again, that we, we've seen, and I haven't included any of those photos in this presentation because frankly, they're, they're far too disturbing. Um, if you want more information about it, or if you would like to see more you know, photos or videos, feel free to contact me and I can share those with you. Um, but the, these traps, again, are, aren't, aren't the answer at all. Um, and while they, they prevent dogs from being trapped, we just had a case recently of a cat uh, being caught in a Duke cuff trap. So again, they're, they're not the answer. Live traps, worth a mention. So some people resort to live trapping as a solution for humane traps. And again, like anything else, they require care and a great deal of attention. Um, there are some species that obviously do not react well to confinement, um, particularly wild animals generally don't react well to confinement. And so whether it's a leg hold or a live trap to contain a wild animal um, is, is extremely concerning and, and um, requires again, uh, a lot of attention. So animals uh, can suffer from self-inflicted wounds. They can pull their claws out of their, their feet. They, um, if, if left unattended for hours or days, they can suffer from exposure, dehydration, starvation, these types of things. And so again, live traps um, are, are not necessarily the answer. So they, they require some oversight. So from a Canadian perspective, a lot of the rhetoric we hear, and again, around the world, the word humane comes up all the time. Traps are humane. Canada is a signatory to the Agreement on International Humane Trapping Standards. Um, so the, the Agreement on Humane Trapping Standards is worth a mention because it's um, what the industry uses to essentially try to make the public complicit to make people believe uh, that there's been all these innovations as it relates to trapping and that's simply not the truth. So um, the International Agreement on Humane Trapping Standards is frankly just a trade agreement. It's not an animal welfare agreement. It's over 20 years old and it was basically a deal that Canada, the United States and Russia um, carved out with Europe. It, it, so in, in the 1990s, the EU had passed a regulation saying that they weren't willing to import any fur coming from a country that was still using a leg hold trap. So to reassure Europe, Canada, the US and Russia said that they would undertake a program that would um, essentially redesign trapping and make traps humane and that they would embark on all of, of this trust, trap testing and research and again, redesign trapping. and. Um, so what essentially it did was it allowed the industry to create um, rules for itself <laughs> to market a product that pretty much was unchanging. And so uh, and, and it's our view that many of the changes that have happened to traps over the last few years have been very cosmetic in nature and that they're fundamentally the same thing. A leg hold trap today is very much the same as it was 200 years ago. Um, whether it has four springs or two springs, whether it has a swivel, whether the jaws are widened, whether there's, um, you know, uh, rubber padding on, uh, uh, lining the jaws, in our opinion, it's all irrelevant. And at the end of the day, wild animals do not wanna be restrained. And it's really not about the design of the trap, but rather the behavior of the individual that's caught in the trap. And arguably you could try to catch wild animals with pillows. And, and it really doesn't matter. Again, it really, they don't wanna be restrained. And so many of the injuries are a result of the animal's reaction and behavior itself, not always necessarily the trap. And so that's important to kind of keep in mind. Um, there are major flaws with this agreement, uh, and, and I encourage you to, to see the link below. Um, you, could, you could read more about it, but it's worth noting that the word humane was never really defined, and, that, and that's a big problem, I think, in our movement, is the term humane gets thrown around quite a lot, but there really is no consensus on the definition. And my idea of humane versus yours versus a veterinarian versus a trapper 
um, I think you'll find there's a wide discrepancy. Indigenous peoples, of course, Canada is, is home to um, in, Indigenous people and it's, it's, it's wonderful. So First Nations, Métis, Inuit. So those are the groups of Indigenous people that help make up Canada. Um, Canada is in a time of reconciliation right now. So there's a lot of discussion that's happened about the impacts of colonization, the generational trauma, uh, frankly, the genocide that many Indigenous uh, peoples have suffered. And so it's really important to recognize Indigenous people and the various laws and international laws that protect them. Uh, and, you know, trapping historically has been part of many Indigenous cultures. And so it really requires us as animal advocates to reach out and to work with Indigenous groups. And there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, trapping typically favors non-Indigenous trappers um, things like annual quotas, um, you know, conflict with traditional traditional trapping methods, and so again, it's 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 really incumbent upon us um, to be inclusive um, when we do launch campaigns and and when we do advocate for policy changes that we reach out to indigenous groups and and to um, again hopefully create those partnerships and alliances. Future of fur in Canada. So just to start to wrap up now my presentation, um, you know, certainly we're encouraged. The number of trapped animals in Canada is coming down. Um, there's a lot of really great voices now of people advocating for animal. It's not just typically your animal rights act, you know, activists. There's you know, scientists, um, there's biologists, there's veterinarians, there's, um, wildlife rehabbers, there's amazing different groups of people that are coming together and um, really seeing a, a better way and a, and a brighter future uh, for our wildlife by offering non-lethal solutions to a lot of um, these, these problems and, and these issues. And um, so some of the, the polling again is also really demonstrating that as well. 81% of Canadians oppose killing animals for their fur, and that's up 6% from 2019. Uh, a couple big wins for us, Canada Goose is no longer buying real fur. So certainly Canada Goose, although I believe it's owned by a US firm, uh, Canada Goose is a very popular park a company here in Canada. Obviously, you know, our, our namesake is included in the corporation's title. Um, so, you know, certainly that's a step in the right direction. Canada Goose still inherently obviously has some problems, but um, it, 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 um, their announcement will obviously no longer serve trappers. And then uh, Winners, a very popular Canadian chain department store, uh, recently committed to becoming fur free in 2020. So again, the, that's another great win. So we, we hope to see more of these things. And again, overall, we, we feel encouraged for the future. So in short, um, please don't buy fur or fur trim and take a moment. You can join us on social media to continue this conversation, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and um, we'll make sure that you, you get those links. That's a fisher there on the, on the left, if you're wondering what animal that is. They um, uh, live in the boreal forest here in Canada. And that's it, my contact information. And thank you so much for, for your attention. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Newton Simoyu to tell us a little bit more about his work in Kenya. Oh, Newton, I think you're on mute. You Sorry. Ah, good. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie Fox. Just a moment. Um, I share my screen. Just a moment, perfect, perfect. So hi everyone, um, I trust uh, you are all keeping safe. I'm so exact, uh, excited to be part of this webinar. I am Newton Simiu from uh, Born Free Kenya, a research officer in Meru Conservation Area. So for today, I'll be taking you through our conservation work we did two years ago in combating illegal snaring and associated bushmeat in Kenya. My presentation will uh, basically uh, look at five key areas. First, I look at where we work. 
I'll take you through the types of traps used in Kenya. Our approach in tackling uh, the problem of uh, snaring and bushmeat, then the impact posed by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And lastly, uh, we look at our plan of action. So where do we work? We work in Kenya, and for those who may not know, uh, Kenya is in Africa. And in Kenya, Bonfree has two main project uh, sites, that is uh, Amboseli Ecosystem and the Meru Conservation Area. For this particular uh, presentation, I'll focus uh, on the work we did, uh, the snaring work we did in Meru Conservation Area. So Meru Conservation Area is um, a landscape that covers approximately 1,544 square miles. This is about 4,000 square kilometers. It is the second largest protected area in Kenya after the Tsavo Conservation Area. Most of you uh, might be well aware of the story with the Tsavo, the man eaters of Tsavo, that is in the years 1890s during the construction of a railway line from Kenya to Uganda. So in our work, we partner with the Kenya Wildlife Service. Uh, Kenya Wildlife Service is a state corporation mandated to conserve, manage wildlife, and enforce related laws and regulations across all protected areas in Kenya. So a bit of introduction. The greatest conservation challenge facing us today is a, a rapid decline in wildlife population. This is uh, majorly due to shrinking uh, spaces for wildlife, increase in human uh, population has led to subdivisions of land. So the wildlife spaces uh, have been encroached. And in some instances, these wildlife are killed, are hunted for food or rather bushmeat, uh, either for local household uh, consumption or income generation. So bushmeat is basically derived from uh, illegal hunting of wildlife. And here in Kenya, the method used majorly it's the use of wire snares. Others include uh, spears, bows, and arrows. So what is snaring? A snare is a long piece of wire with a loop at the end. The wire might have uh, either uh, one strand or more, depending on the target species. It is um, strategically located uh, by the poachers along animal trails uh, or water uh, sources. This is just to increase the chances of uh, the snare trapping an animal. The snare catches an animal by the neck, leg, or trunk. Eventually, it tightens up as the animal struggles to free itself. And this leads to a slow and um, painful death. So what are some of the approach uh, that we use to tackle this problem of snaring and bushmeat? We have two main approaches. One, we, uh, we deployed the snaring patrols. This is basically a team of uh, bone free team and the Kenya Wildlife Service armed rangers going out into the protected areas, walking and spending four to five hours per patrol searching and removing these deadly snares. Secondly, we uh, also en uh, engage a community partnership. Community engagement is critical in conservation. And for us, we, we based majorly on education and outreach. And how did we achieve this? We had mobile uh, cinema units. This is basically going out into the community and schools screening conservation films just to create awareness on conservation uh, issues. Uh, and then ecological trips to the park and especially to the school going children to give them an opportunity and ecology trips are uh, fully sponsored trips into the park where the school going children are given that opportunity to go and enjoy wildlife viewing in the park. And then also provided a platform for these young pupils to express themselves and just to get their ideas, their thinking 
about the issue of conservation. And that one, we achieved it through essay competition, debates competition, and also formation of environmental clubs within their schools um, where they, they learn, and especially around uh, the protected areas. Also provided forums for the communities, just going out, out, out there into the community, meeting these community members, uh, discussing with them, getting to understand what are the driving forces making them to set snares into the park. So these are just but a few, some of the key scenarios uh, during our snaring patrols. And um, let me mention snares, these were snares are indiscriminate and very cruel. It doesn't matter the target species, all animals are at risk. Be it the big animals, be it the small ones, all of them are at risk. The pictures uh, below, uh, the pictures on the screen shows uh, some of the key scenarios. You can see the elephant, you can see how cruel that snare was. Uh, that elephant did manage to survive. Also, uh, you can see the bushback. It also didn't manage to survive. It's so cruel and it's real. At the bottom, that is a lion with a snare on the leg. Fortunate enough, the lion monitoring team came across this lion walking with the snare. Uh, we managed to uh, track the lion. The area vet darted it and we removed the snare. And currently, as we speak, the lion is doing pretty well. So we realized that uh, the young generation are the future of conservation and are the backbone of, when we talk of conservation, they are the backbone. So if we, uh, if we, we change their mind at this early stage, it will have a greater impact for posterity when we talk about conservation. So the pictures shows some of um, uh, pupils just being taken through uh, uh, sessions, uh, being shown uh, films and talks on conservation. And below you can see some of the community members being engaged on issues affecting them and driving forces, making them to go to the protected areas and set uh, snares. So the two approaches actually had an immense impact on our work. On the picture, these are some of uh, the snares that were recovered during our desnaring patrol. And this is the desnaring team. Overall, we recovered over 2,000 wire snares. What does that mean? That led to saving over 2,000 wildlife that could have otherwise been trapped by these indiscriminate wires. We reached out to over 80,000 persons. This is uh, in the community areas and also in the schools. And the knowledge uptake was so impressive. We could, the community could start um, reporting issues uh, whenever an animal crosses over into the community land, they'll, they'll call either the bone free team or the Kenya wildlife team to come and uh, uh, handle the animal. And before then, you'll find that the community didn't have that knowledge or that compassion to conserve this wildlife. So whenever the animal could cross over out into the community area, they'll gang up, kill the animal, and that was it. But now they used to uh, report. Over time, we had a decline in the number of snares within the protected area. And that was so impressive. So two years ago, this issue of bushmeat and snaring, we had it under control. But as we speak, COVID pandemic has also come with its own challenges and the situation is not the same. So what are some of the impacts caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? We, there is massive loss of jobs to the youths, and these are the breadwinners. Lockdowns, the poor cannot afford food on the table. So what does that mean? The people 
the poor people living around the protected area, they go for easy food. So that is bushmeat. That means they go back, they go into the park and set snares to get food. Recent scenarios, these men here in April this year, they were arrested by the Kenya Wildlife Service Rangers with several uh, kilograms of bushmeat. And if, uh, if this, the, the penalty for this in Kenya here is not uh, a jail time of not less than three years with no option of fine. On the right is the Bone Free Lion Monitoring Team. As we speak last weekend, as they were doing their routine uh, lion monitoring uh, work, they came across 14 wire snares that were put not far from the road. So you can imagine if these people have the courage to go and um, into the lion territories and set these uh, snares, it is a serious, uh, it, it is something that is so serious, uh, which needs to to be uh, handled. So the resurgence of uh, snaring and bushmeat will definitely impact wildlife numbers within Meru conservation area. To handle this, our immediate action is to reinstate the desnaring program that aims to ensure a safe habitat for free ranging wildlife populations in the Meru conservation area. This is for all the wildlife and even including our key species. The, talk about the giraffes, talk about the elephants, talk about the lions. Lastly, think about this poor person that he or she doesn't have any source of food. This person living near or around the park. It is very difficult to convince this person not to go for bushmeat. So how, what is our plan uh, going forth? In the long run, we plan to uh, closely engage with the local communities to ensure benefits through alternative sources of livelihood. And we believe if we provide them an alternative source of food, this will uh, reduce the chances of that poor person, that poor man or woman going into the protected area, risking her life or his life, setting up the snare just to get food. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my time. Thank you so much. And I will hand you over back to Angela. Welcome, Angela. Thank you, Newton, uh, that, and Leslie and Liz. Those were all really very informative presentations. And I'd like to ask all of our panelists to come back on. Newton, you can stay. Uh, and uh, we'll all go off mute now. Uh, I would like to, oh, I need to turn my camera on. There we go. <laughs> um, so we've had a number of really great questions coming in uh, with about 10 minutes remaining. So I'm gonna have to pick and choose. Um, but I wanna, I wanna start with one that kind of follows up on um, Newton, what you were just talking about, which is the impact or, or really the driving factors of snaring for certain people who are looking at that, you know, people who are in poverty, who are looking at either as a personal source of food for their families or for income. Um, I'd like to first open it up to you to see if there's anything else you'd like to comment on, on that aspect. But then our question also relates, you know, understandably, you know, if that, that is happening in Kenya, what are the driving factors in a country like the US for people to trap? You know, is it for food? Is it for income? You know, and so Newton, if you will start us off and then Liz, you can jump in after. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, you realize that um, in Kenya, the major driving forces making people to 
set up these snares. These people are very poor. Uh, most of them, they have even families they can't feed, uh, they can't provide for. So, and uh, being, that, being that getting a, a paying job, it's kind of so competitive and so strenuous here in Kenya. So you find that these people mostly living around these uh, protected areas, they tend to uh, get into the park, uh, even stay in the park, spend more time in the park. And in some instances, you'll find them uh, uh, pitching temporal structures just to set their traps, wait for this uh, animal to be trapped. And they go even further carrying, um, carrying with, 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 with them with themselves cooking pots. So they cook from the park, eat from there, and then they move out. So they, they, it's, it's a serious uh, thing here in Kenya, and especially it's illegal to do that. And so as much as the Kenya Wildlife Service is on the lookout, but some of them are so, uh, they sneak in anytime, even at night. So it's a serious issue, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Newton. That's that's really interesting. And I think it's a very different face that we see here in the US. Um, so I think the drivers for trapping in the US are kind of multifaceted. We have, um, in terms of private citizens, we have the fur trade, which is in decline, has been for many years. And we're hoping that that may just kind of peter out. Um, of course, we will continue campaigning because people are turning away from fur products in, in droves. Unfortunately, one of the main reasons as well for trapping here in the US is recreation. People literally doing it for fun. And we saw that so clearly in some news reports at the beginning of sort of towards the end of last year. So we'd all been in some form of lockdown for some time. Um, and I think it was New York State that put out this press release talking about what they referred to as record sales of hunting and trapping licenses. And they were promoting it as a positive thing that, you know, with COVID, um, and this is the way trapping has always been promoted in the US. It's this kind of, you know, wholesome outdoor activity that you can do with, you know, multi generations of your family. And they were saying that because people were not able to do their normal recreational activities inside, they were turning to outdoor activities, which included trapping. So we're literally, we're expecting to see a spike next year, just because, put it bluntly, people were bored during lockdown and thought it might be a fun thing to try. That's the only way we can really interpret that data. Uh, we're not sure how much of a spike we're gonna see, but certainly um, according to multiple press releases from multiple states saying the same thing, it could be significant. And then of course we have the, the quote unquote pest control, pest control of um, trapping, which is often carried out either by commercial companies or government agencies. And finally, a large part of trapping is carried out in order to prevent predation of livestock. Now, while people could argue, you know, that livestock predation is something, this is people's livelihoods to protect, I'll be perfectly honest with you, we run a sanctuary here for, I'm sitting in the sanctuary on site, we look after 430 monkeys. We fence them to protect them. We don't lie, we don't put traps down. There are other ways to protect animals. And there is a certain irony in, you know, killing certain animals, trapping certain native animals in order to protect other animals who are being raised to later be killed for food. So I think those are probably the core drivers for um, trapping in the US. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Liz, you just touched on one thing uh, that, that Leslie also mentioned in her presentation, and that was the decline in demand. Uh, and I, Leslie, you also quoted the statistic about, you know, Canadians, you know, uh, increasingly no longer supporting trapping. Um, we've had some uh, a few questions about seals and the, you know, clubbing of baby seals and seal fur. Um, you know, if, if trapping, or excuse me, if the demand for fur is in decline, why is this still going on? Um, do we expect to see an end to it someday? I, are the trappers putting themselves out of business? You know, how, what, you know, can you comment on, on some of that? <laughs> yeah, seals is a really complicated and long-standing issue. And um, the majority of seals are no longer targeted for their fur specifically. Um, seals are also not trapped, they're shot. Um, and so 
from my under, understanding, and certainly I think there's individuals out there who know much more about the sealing issue than I do. My understanding is a lot of um, seals are killed for meat. Um, the meat is sold uh, at, you know, high-end restaurants type of a thing. Uh, there's a lot of efforts now to sort of, sort of manufacture the need um, uh, for some of these products uh, or the, the meat. And then also uh, seal penis awkward to talk about, um, but some nations believe that there's properties in seal penis that has medicinal qualities. And so again, I think there's this, um, there's a lot of money being dumped into manufacturing and fabricating the need for these products. So there is no need and it doesn't exist, but there's this like overwhelming, the subsidies are, are absolutely incredible. And and that is really worth a mention, actually, and that wasn't in my presentation, but the, the fur industry, specifically in Canada anyways, is artificially propped up by subsidies. And if left to their own merit, they wouldn't exist. Fur farming and, and trapping wouldn't exist without unbelievable amount of government taxpayer funds. And that includes sealing as well. On its own merit, there is no money um, in it. It's just again, you know, made, made for that. So there are incredible organizations doing incredible work to end the sealing industry off the top of my head. International Fund for Animal Welfare has been campaigning against the seal hunt for a very long time. Um, also HSI, that's Humane Society International, Humane Society Canada, um, you know, have taken on the seal issue. So I encourage people to get in touch with those organizations. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Liz, I wanna come back to you. Um, we had a couple of questions about legislation mm -hmm. um, and we can start with the U.S. and then Leslie, um, if you want to talk about Canada and Newton, if there's anything going on at the government level to prevent this um, in Kenya, I, I'll, maybe we can go all three, everyone talk about kind of the, the, the law enforcement aspect of this and, and the legislation. So Liz, do you want to talk about um, a couple of bills that we've been working on here at Born for USA? Yeah, of course. So um, I'll be very quick. One, we've been working for a number of years. One of our major focuses has been the Refuge from Cruel Trapping Act, which would look at, as the name suggests, uh, trapping on public lands and quite specifically within the National Wildlife Refuges. We want trapping banned everywhere, but we feel like, goodness, this should be winnable. We should be able to stop people from killing animals within wildlife refuges where they're supposed to be safe. We are hoping that that will be introduced in this coming session. Um, there's a few things going on behind the scenes. I'm not sure quite how much I can say right now, but that is certainly something that we're working on and we were hopeful will be, get, will be introduced soon. There's also um, another act, the LIFT Act, which would look at a slightly wider remit. We don't have a time scale for that yet, but we do have two very strong federal bills that we have been working on and we are hopeful we're gonna get some change with. Leslie, do you wanna talk about? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, so um, one of the initiatives that we're, we're working on, so certainly the trapping issue is provincial and, and so it creates a bit of an issue because we really need, a province, a province, anyone <laughs> to take a leadership position that um, hopefully other provinces can adopt. So one thing we've been working on here in British Columbia where, where I live is um, again, looking at some low hanging fruit. And so certainly everybody can agree warning signs would be most appropriate. Like if, if we can't protect wild animals, can we protect at least domestic animals? Like is, is that, is there an appetite for that? And the government seems to be willing and open um, to those criticisms. And, and there's actually been two lawsuits uh, here in British Columbia of people whose dogs were killed in conibear traps. So I think that's hurried that along. Um, also conversations happening related to ID tags and also setbacks. So not having traps so close uh, you know, to homes and schools. And so it's always a challenge when you get into these conversations because a lot of that legislation is really wishy-washy and that it doesn't really do anything to end the suffering of wild animals. So we really need to keep pushing. Um, I think the opportunities for us uh, as an organization and also uh, if there's any Canadians on this call is we really need the political will. We need to cut the subsidies. I think if we can end 
um, access to the public purse, that's where it'll really hurt the fur industry. And so while most people, it's really easy to commit to being fur free and not buying fur, the next step we need to take is we need to engage our politicians and tell them to turn off the tap. And, and that if the industry wants to succeed, they can do so on their own merit without the help of taxpayers. And Newton, we've, we've reached our time. Uh, I wanna give you the, the last word here before we close up. So is there anything you'd like to comment on, uh, on this subject or, or any others you'd like to, to talk about? Uh, sure, um, in Kenya, the scenario is different. Uh, trapping or rather snaring is illegal. Bushmeat is illegal. And um, Kenya Wildlife Service uh, is mandated to execute the laws and regulations that are in place. And as I said, some of the penalties, three years in prison, not less than three years imprisonment uh, without uh, uh, no option of paying fines. Yeah, so basically that's uh, what I can share about Kenya. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Liz, Leslie, Newton, and everybody who joined us today. Um, we will be sending out an email tomorrow to everyone who registered. It will include a link to this recording. Uh, we have recorded this entire webinar, along with some the uh, the links that you see on your screen, how you can engage with with all of all of us on social the link to the Amazon petition that, that Liz mentioned and uh, other actions and ways that you can become involved. Uh, and I'd also like, before I go, I'd also like to invite you to go to bornforusa.org. If you enjoyed this webinar, please make a gift, even a small one that will help us keep presenting this kind of information to the public. And again, thank you all for attending and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.